Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the inaugural Reverend Richard R. Russell Lecture honoring Father Russell's 25 years of extraordinary service to the Hill community. As I welcome you all, I include those watching from home via our Facebook or website. And as we always do, I ask you before we begin to silence all your beloved cell phones. There are several alumni and friends who have made this lecture possible, and I would like to publicly thank them. Kate Moore, John Clark Kane Jr., Ed Smith, Steve McPhee, Patricia Perry, Attilio Granada, and his priest support group, including myself, Father Tom Zinsky, Father Joe Donnelly, Monsignor Mike Mata, and Father Jim Shanley, all of whom are here tonight. Father Russell was the first Catholic priest to receive the Yale Medal, the Association of Yale Alumni's highest honor for distinguished service to the university. He received it in 1991, two years after leaving the chaplaincy in 1989. The citation reads in part, though this hall still rings with the laughter associated with your famous invocation taglines, we remember best your long nights of work with students, faculty, and staff, whether communicants or simply one of the thousands whose faith placed them outside your professional bounds, but never outside your heart. Patient and wise counselor, your genuine faith and friendly spirit helped broaden Yale's outlook and deepen its respect for the differences among us, while knitting together those essential elements that unify all women and men of goodwill. What an outstanding tribute to a fine man, who has also been a role model for me personally and a true longtime friend of this chapel. It's great to have you with us tonight, and it's a joy to honor you with your life's work. And as I welcome all of you tonight, I want to recognize two guests traveling with Cardinal Levada, Archbishop George Niederauer, retired Archbishop of San Francisco, and Monsignor Charles Murphy, the Director of the Permanent Diaconate in the Diocese of Portland, Maine. Welcome to you both as well. It is a special delight this evening to welcome Cardinal Levada, a classmate of Father Russell's in the seminary and a close friend. Cardinal Levada served as Archbishop of Portland, Oregon, and then Archbishop of San Francisco. He was chairman of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on Doctrine before taking on his new duties as the Prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith under Pope Benedict XVI in 2005. During his tenure as head of the congregation, he was the highest ranking American in the Roman Curia. He was named a Cardinal in 2006. He was a principal editor for the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, today, he is present emeritus of the Pontifical Biblical Commission, the International Theological Commission, and the Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Dei, and also several other congregations in Rome. On January 5, 2011, he was appointed among the first members of the newly created Pontifical Council for the Promotion of the New Evangelization. After Cardinal Levada's remarks, I invite you to write a question on one of the index cards found on your chair, and I ask that you pass your question to the aisle and it will be collected. Uh, Jaska Birskupa will serve as the moderator and ask the questions. Please join me in welcoming Cardinal Levada for his lecture, A New Apologetics for the New Evangelization. Cardinal Levada. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Father Boulogne, for your introduction. And of course, it's a great joy for me to be here in the presence of Father Russell, my classmate and good friend, and to uh, be able to participate in this honor uh, to him uh, by inaugurating a lecture series uh, in his name. I returned to Morehouse. So my first visit here to New Haven was to visit him at, when he was chaplain here. And I'm very happy to 
uh, to, to uh, look forward to with you the uh, other lectures that may follow in this, uh, in this series. Uh, Dick and I were seminary classmates at the Matifical North American College at the Vatican and followed the same curriculum in theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome for our licentiate degrees. Um, I uh, noticed that uh, uh, 25 years uh, is a long time in a, in a ministry. I, when I look back at my own uh, curriculum vitae, I, I, the longest I ever ha had any one position was 10 years as Archbishop of San Francisco. And I keep uh, seeming to uh, uh, have a hard time, as one of my uh, colleagues mentioned, uh, hanging on to a job. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I just want to say when we were younger, we used to joke about the evening of life off somewhere in the future. And now I think uh, we realize that that evening of life has arrived. So Dick and I were ordained priests together with 52 other classmates from the United States at the altar of the chair in St. Peter's Basilica uh, in 19, December 20, 1961. That's a period that is now referred to in ecclesiastical history as pre-conciliar. Uh, just over a year, we cel a year ago, we celebrated the golden anniversary of our priestly ordination. And I'm very grateful today for your invitation to be with you to give this inaugural lecture in his honor. Um, I've titled this a, a New Apologetics for the New Evangelization, and I have four parts to it, and I'll just tell you what they are in advance so you know where I'm going. Uh, that first of all, the church is called to a new evangelization. I want to say a little bit about the new evangelization. And then secondly, um, something about apologetics. I've entitled this Apologizing or Apologetics? Question mark. The third part is an apologetics that is new, issues of method. And then the fourth part, what is the content, what should be the content of the new apologetics. And uh, th that, w that would be my, the gist of my talk. So let me begin by uh, uh, talking about the church is called to a new evangelization. The term new evangelization was used for the first time by Pope John Paul II in the year 1983 during a pastoral visit to Haiti. With his customary foresight, that great pope looked ahead to the year 1992, which would mark the fifth centenary of the coming of the gospel to the new world. And he invited his brother bishops to undertake a new evangelization. He said, new in ardor, methods, and expression. We may ask, why a new evangelization? The proclamation of the good news has been a fundamental aspect of the church's life for 2,000 years. In Luke's gospel, Jesus begins his public ministry by applying to himself the words of the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. In the sequel to his gospel, the Acts of the Apostles, Luke describes how the same Holy Spirit empowered the followers of Jesus to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts 1.8. Following an ancient tradition, during the Easter season, the church sets before us the account of the first evangelization recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. We hear these readings at Mass. We heard one today about, about Paul and Barnabas, not only to recall what was done long ago, but to reflect on how we can continue that proclamation in our own day. The perennial task of the church to evangelize was underscored by the Second Vatican Council the two great dogmatic constitutions of the Council on the Church and on Divine Revelation both open with a call to evangelize the world. And the Council Fathers also dedicated a special document to missionary work in the Church, to the Decree Ad Gentis. In the decade following the Council, this aspect of its teachings, that is, about evangelization, received less attention. But that state of affairs was changed in 1974 when Pope Paul VI who on his election as Pope had chosen the name of the great missionary apostle, convoked a synod of bishops to discuss the evangelization of the modern world, and subsequently Paul, Pope Paul issued the apostolic exhortation Evangelii Nunziani, announcing the gospel. This synod and exhortation put evangelization on the front burner. Four years later, one of the most enthusiastic participants in that synod, a young Polish bishop named Karol Wojtyła, was elected Pope, and he brought with him the spirit of a new evangelization that began to energize the whole church. 
What are the distinctive characteristics of this new evangelization? Here I want to draw on the work of the late Cardinal Avery Dulles, who once served as a visiting professor here at Yale. In his book, Evangelization for the Third Millennium, Dulles presented 10 characteristics of the new evangelization. I'm not going to tell, talk about all 10, I just want to provide a brief overview of these points and then reflect on what role apologetics should play in putting them into practice. First and, foremost, first and foremost, a hallmark of the new evangelization should be the centrality of Christ. As Pope John Paul told some German bishops on their visit to Rome uh, back in 1992, only from a personal relationship with Jesus can an effective evangelization develop. This might seem self-evident, but the remarkable growth of evangelical and charismatic Protestant communities in traditionally Catholic countries, especially, for example, in Latin America, challenges us Catholics to examine our conscience on this point. It can be said with some regret that at times our catechetical and educational efforts have presumed a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that has not been there. The result is that people learn about Christ, but feel that they do not know him. Secondly, evangelization has a new dimension today since it takes place in an ecumenical context. And because the Christian faith has now spread throughout the whole world, it also calls for interreligious dialogue. Indeed, one of the reasons Pope John XXIII convoked the Second Vatican Council was to further the cause of Christian unity, both as a good in itself and because the divisions among Christians hindered an effective proclamation of the gospel to nonbelievers. In the ecumenical and interreligious spheres, the new evangelization takes the form of both dialogue and proclamation, recognizing what we have in common, while at the same time professing the unique gift of salvation in Christ. Dulles also touched on the question of who is responsible for the work of evangelization. The first agent, if you will, is every Christian. By virtue of our baptism, each of us is called to be not only a disciple, but an apostle. Over her long history, the church has carried out her task of preaching the gospel very often through religious orders founded to do missionary work. Such work is invaluable, but it is not sufficient for the rest of us to make a donation to the Society for the Propagation of the Faith, for example, and feel we have done our share in the work of evangelization implicit in our baptism. Every one of us must proclaim the gospel by word and example. You. Sitting here, you may be the only Catholic someone else knows. But lest you feel the burden too heavily, Dulles also points out that the most powerful agent in evangelization is the Holy Spirit. Pope Paul wrote, it is the Holy Spirit who impels each individual to proclaim the gospel. And it is he who in the depths of consciences causes the word of salvation to be accepted and understood. The second part, apologizing or apologetics, question mark. The term apologetics used to be a familiar one in Catholic circles, but since it has fallen out of the lexicon of so many Catholics and other Christians today, it may be useful to define it briefly, especially since it's the central point of this talk. First, what apologetics is not. Last Monday, a review, you see I was still working on this talk. So last Monday, I was a review of one of that evening's programs in our local paper, the San Francisco Chronicle, caught my eye. In good journalistic style, the first paragraph set the scene for what followed. And I quote, an apology to elephants may sound like an awkward or even pretentious title for a film. This is the Chronicle article. By the time the HBO documentary ends, though, Viewers may be more than ready to apologize for what humans have done and are doing to elephants. First, a disclaimer, I didn't watch this program because I was still working on the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so apologizing in the sense of saying you're sorry to elephants or to one another or to the world is not what apologetics is about. Even though the English words apology and, ap and apologetics have their origin in the same Greek word apologia. In the Greek language, the word meant in ancient times a legal defense in court, or more generally, it was used to indicate an explanation of one's reasons for doing something. This could be explaining why you're apologizing, by saying you're sorry on the one hand, or in the case of apologetics, it could be giving the reasons for being a believer in God, in Christ, in the church, in any and all of what we profess to believe at every mass on Sunday when we gather 
when we get it together, we say credo, I believe. Blessed Cardinal Newman used the word apologia, apologia in this, in this latter sense, for the title of his Apologia Pro Vita Sua, the Latin means a defense of his life. The book also bears this subtitle, Being a History of His Religious Opinions by John Henry Cardinal Newman. Since this is a classic work of apologetics in an autobiographical style, it can help illustrate one of the genres that Christian apologetics has taken over the past two millennia. Newman says he bothered to defend himself not for the sake of his own reputation, but because Dr. Kingsley, whom he calls his accuser, maligns not only Newman for his conversion to the Roman Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church and its celibate priesthood. Here in Newman's own words from his preface to the second impression, or stamping of the book in 1865, is the reason why he mounted this defense against the calumnies of his accuser. And I quote him. It was in the number for January 1864 of a magazine of wide circulation and in an article upon Queen Elizabeth that a popular writer took occasion formally to accuse me by name of thinking so lightly of the virtue of veracity as, set in, as in set terms to have countenanced and defended that neglect of it which he at the same time imputed to the Catholic priesthood. His words were these, and he quotes Kingsley. Truth, for its own sake, had never been a virtue with the Roman clergy. Father Newman informs us that it need not, and on the whole ought not to be, that cunning is the weapon which heaven has given to the saints wherewith to withstand the brute male force of the wicked world which marries and is given in marriage. Whether his notion be doctrinally correct or not, it is at least historically so. End of the quote from Kingsley. He wrote a correspondence with Kingsley that proved to no avail. He published the correspondence in a pamphlet, and then his accuser returned to his accusations in his pamphlet, entitled, What Then Does Dr. Newman Mean? So Newman believed he had no recourse but to write his apologia. Here is his rationale, and I quote, Even if I could have found it consistent with my duty to my own reputation to leave such an elaborate impeachment of my moral nature unanswered, my duty to my brethren in the Catholic priesthood would have forbidden such a course. In exculpating myself, it was plain I should be pursuing no mere personal quarrel. I was making my protest in behalf of a large body of men of high character, of honest and religious minds, and of sensitive honor, who were insulted by my accuser, and who, as occasion offered, bestowed on me the formal and public expression of their approbation." End of quote. The autobiographical character of Newman's Apologia as a spiritual journey from his Calvinistic Anglicanism as a youth through the Oxford movement to his conversion to Catholicism recalls in some respects the confessions of St. Augustine, which are often called, the, which book is often called the first autobiography in the history of literature. Augustine's adversaries in the Roman Empire of the fourth and fifth centuries were different from Newman's to be sure but his report of his spiritual journeys in search of Christ and how he found him also served as an apologetics to explain the choices he came to make on that journey. The Greek word apologia found its place in Christian culture from its use in the first letter of St. Peter, chapter 3, verse 15, where we are told, always be ready to give an explanation, apologion, to anyone who asks you for a reason, logon, logos, logon, for your hope. That's the quote from 1 Peter. Ever since the second century, when St. Justin Martyr addressed his first apology, it's a title he used, to the Emperor Antoninus, Christian thinkers have sought to explain why we believe what we believe. Such explanations have served both to deepen the understanding of Christians and to provide an opportunity for dialogue with those outside the community of believers. This, I believe, is the essence of apologetics. Over the centuries, a reasoned explanation of the faith has taken on different forms. We might go so far as to say that apologetics is enculturated evangelization. What shape should it take in our culture? During his apostolic visit to the United States several years ago, Pope Benedict XVI spoke to this question. 
When he met with the bishops, the Holy Father observed, and I quote, in a society that rightly values personal liberty, the church needs to promote at every level of her teaching, in catechesis, preaching, seminary and university instruction, and apologetics aimed at affirming the truth of Christian revelation, the harmony of faith and reason, and a sound understanding of freedom, seen in positive terms as a liberation both from the limitations of sin and for an authentic and fulfilling life. In a word, went on Pope Benedict, the gospel has to be preached and taught as an integral way of life, offering an attractive and true answer intellectually and practically to real human problems. So Pope Benedict. As regards affirming the truth of Christian revelation, Sometimes people have the impression that apologetics entails proving that the Christian religion or the Catholic faith is true. I would suggest the purpose of apologetics is more modest, although it is still essential. Its purpose is to demonstrate that the faith we profess is credible, that is, that there are reasons for our hope. The distinction between proof and credi credibility is important for several reasons, but here I would just point out two of them, the nature of the truth we profess and the audience for whom that truth is intended. First, the nature of the truth we profess. The Catholic faith is founded on the conviction that in Jesus Christ, God has revealed himself as fully as possible within the limitations of our world and our created human nature. We profess certain things to be true about God because they have been revealed to us by Christ during his earthly life and by the subsequent reflection of his followers under the guidance of the Holy Spirit called tradition. The intellect has a role to play here, but there is an interior instruction which reveals realities about God and about our relationship to him that we could never attain by reason alone. For example, it is possible to come to believe in a creator from the evidence of creation itself, but to know that this creator is one God who is at the same time a communion of three persons, a trinity, and that we have been invited to enter into communion of love with our God by our union with Christ and the Holy Spirit is a truth that reason could never attain. We believe that because it has been revealed by God. Secondly, there is the audience for whom this revelation is intended. One of the hallmarks of Jesus' ministry was that much of it was directed to ordinary, simple people and not the, to the educated elite of his society. God's invitation is extended to all, and he communicates his truth in many ways. You may know people, indeed members of your own family, who have little formal education, and yet have a faith that is both deep and wise. If the sole avenue to God's revelation in Christ were through a series of logical arguments, only those with a penchant for such thought would be saved. In fact, our Lord almost seems to suggest the opposite. For example, he gave thanks to his heavenly father, and I quote him, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to infants. If this is so, what need is there for apologetics? Are we Catholics guilty, as some of our adversaries su suggest, of checking our brains at the door when we come to the church? This is precisely where apologetics serves a purpose. Not to prove that the revealed doctrines we believe are true, but to demonstrate that they are reasonable. As Pope John Paul II showed at length in his encyclical letter on faith and reason, and as Pope Benedict reminded us, our Catholic tradition recognizes a harmony between faith and reason. Each is an avenue to the truth. Our human reason seeks to know the reality that surrounds us. The act of faith, too, is a free human act and as such it must involve both our will and our intellect. Faith itself is also a grace, a gift of God. It is not the conclusion of a syllogism or the sum of a mathematical equation. Speaking of the role of grace, the great English apologist Ronald Knox used this image. The water of conviction is changed into the wine of faith. My third part, my part. apologetics and apologetics that is new, issues of method. Pope John Paul II proposed a new evangelization that would be new in ardor, methods, and expression. Perhaps that can be a cue for how we should undertake a renewal of apologetics. 
In the light of the developments of the modern era, especially in science and historical studies, studies, I think it necessary to suggest that the method of a new apologetics must be marked in particular by a philosophical rigor that takes the scientific and historical challenges to Christianity seriously. It should be thoroughly biblical in its approach to the centrality of Jesus Christ, and it should eschew polemics in favor of dialogue. Cardinal Francis George, current Archbishop of Chicago, has identified four characteristics of a new apologetics that sum up well the challenges of an apologetics for today, new in its ardor, method, and expression. First, says George, the new, and I quote here, the new apologetics must have a deep understanding of the Catholic faith on its own terms. This is where we must begin, but we cannot end there. An apologist understands not only what is taught, but why it is taught, along with the historical context of our beliefs. So, Cardinal George. Here, George echoes Newman of a century and a half earlier, when he told a group of Catholic laity in Victorian England, I want a laity who knows its faith through and through, and who knows enough of history to defend it. Secondly, according to Cardinal George, a, the new apologist must be as scientifically, and here I quote him, as scientifically and philosophically sophisticated as secularists, and as biblically knowledgeable as Christian fundamentalists." End of quote. This presupposes that in the spirit of Vatican II, we have an openness to positions other than our own, not only to better critique them, but also to recognize the potential positive implications of what others are asserting even for ourselves. In a certain sense, secularism and fundamentalist fundamentalism are opposing responses to the challenge posed by modernity to the traditional and cultural transmission of the faith among Christians, Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox, at least until the Enlightenment. Especially among early modern Protestant scholars who embraced the new biblical criticism with its ideological rationalism and reductionist historical criticism, rather than an apologetics of rather than an apologetics that responded intelligently to these presuppositions, too many Christians embraced the new ideas in ways that often emptied the creeds of their faith content. Perhaps the example of Thomas Jefferson can be useful here. His faith was based on the deism of the Enlightenment. He went to the trouble of editing out any reference to Jesus' miracles, including Christ's resurrection, to create a gospel story more compatible for believers like himself. Not tied to the tradition of a doctrinal church, Jefferson was an early example of the religious individualism that is by now a characteristic phenomenon of the American religious landscape. I am a sect in myself, said Jefferson. And his contemporary Thomas Paine avowed, my mind is my church. More recent biblical scholarship, especially among Catholics, has avoided the excesses of such reductionist interpretations to find in the Bible, not science or history textbooks, but confessional accounts, believers who experienced the unique person and message of Jesus, and who took pains to show how he fulfilled the promises made by God to his people throughout the history of Israel. In this perspective, the Bible gains in credibility as it deepens our understanding of the person and mission of Jesus in God's plan through the prayer, reflection, and witness of the community of disciples he formed as church. <clears throat> in the third place, Cardinal George thinks that uh, the new apologist must create responses to these challenges through positive explanations of the faith. For this task, in my view, a familiarity with the catechism of the Catholic Church is essential. I want to just put a footnote. Father Boulogne introduced me as the principal editor. If I was not, I was on the editorial committee. Cardinal Schoenborn was the principal editor of the, of the uh, catechism of the Catholic Church, but it was, uh, one of, uh, it was a very interesting task that I was involved in for some time. Uh, the text of the Catechism, whose 20th anniversary of publication is one of the two reasons for which Pope Benedict XVI proclaimed a year of faith, the other was the 50th anniversary of the beginning of the Second Vatican Council, guarantees a comprehensive and accurate presentation of the faith of the Church 
that is coherent in showing how the faith we believe, the creed, the faith we celebrate, liturgy and sacraments, the faith we live, virtues and commandments, and the prayer of faith, beginning with the Our Father, form a beautiful symphony of the Catholic faith. The word symphony was used by Pope John Paul II in his apostolic constitution, promulgating the new catechism, and in which he declared the catechism to be, quote, a sure norm for teaching the faith, and thus a valid and legitimate instrument for ecclesial communion, end of quote. Cardinal George calls his fourth and final point the most important one. I hear I quote him, the new apologetics must be a personal and non-defensive loving response to arguments against the Catholic faith, even by those who in fact hate the Catholic Church. Those who on the one hand believe that all religions are stifling illusions, and on the other, those who misrepresent the Bible." End of quote. He reminds us that in responding with humility and respect, we must love the enemies of the faith. And we must also love Holy Scripture more than do fundamentalist Christians, and love the world more than do secularists. Our approach today should be one of dialogue, not diatribe. This does not mean falling into indifferentism, the vague idea that all religions are more or less true, or into the relativism that says, well, that may be true for you. Real dialogue is carried out with a conviction that the truth is ultimately something we can apprehend and agree upon, and that the participants in the dialogue are convinced that they can learn from one another in that pursuit of truth. During the Second Vatican Council, soon after his election, Pope Paul VI issued his first encyclical, Ecclesiam Suam. In that landmark document, the Holy Father enunciated four characteristics of dialogue which I believe capture the way we should carry out our ecumenical and interreligious conversations. Such dialogue should possess clarity in expressing our point of view. It should be marked by meekness rather than arrogance, following the example of Christ himself. It should be confident, not only about one's own convictions, but also in the goodwill of one's dialogue partner. And it should show sensitivity to the situation of the persons involved. In such a dialogue, thought Pope Paul, here I use a quote from him, truth is wedded to charity and understanding to love. End of quote. What a remarkable ideal, Pope Paul enunciated. Truth is wedded to charity and understanding to love. This is easy to say, but difficult to attain. The Catholic apologetics worthy of the name assumes a, sta a stance of humility before two profound mysteries, the mystery of God and the mystery of the human person. It takes seriously the role of the intellect in coming to faith, but it, recognizing, it, recogni but it recognizes that saying credo, I believe, is not an admission wrung out of a reluctant opponent at the conclusion of an argument. It is a testimony to the saying of Jesus himself, the truth will set you free. Fourth part, what should be the content of a new apologetics? In this final part of my talk, I would like to offer some reflections about the content of this new apologetics, particularly from the point of view of our American culture. I do not pretend that my account is exhaustive or definitive, and for this reason I will describe it as a landscape of sorts. I take for granted that the classic preambles of faith that have been part of the church's apologetic task from the beginning, providing the foundation for theological study of the word of God, must not be neglected. For example, the question of the existence of God, the possibility of God's revelation, and the ability of the human intellect to know, to know the truth. To begin with, I want to uh, recall that the overarching issue for apologetics is and remains the question of God. Some 50 years ago, the Jesuit theologian, Father John Courtney Murray, was invited to give a lecture series at Yale, which he entitled, The Problem of God. In these lectures, Murray addressed three themes, the biblical problem of God, the theological problem of God, and the challenge of the so-called death of God. Now, the term death of God was current in the 1960s. As I recall, it had a rather short shelf life, and I do not recall any reference to it for decades. 
At its root, one finds the perennial question of atheism. This question is not new. In the Old Testament book of Psalms, the psalmist says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. In the Middle Ages, the great Dominican theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, began his learned apologetic addressed to Jews and Muslims, the Summa Contra Gentiles, with a discussion of how we could know the existence of God from the world around us. Some of us here this evening can recall as well how the institutionalized atheism of the last century's political movements like Nazism and communism dominated vast sectors of contemporary culture. So too our current American landscape can seem hostile to believe in God. The appearance of aggressive apostles of atheism like uh, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and Sam Harris provides a double challenge because the arguments of these apostles of atheism are too often based on an unsophisticated caricature of Christian belief, at least from the point of view of Catholic tradition. In meeting the challenge of such militant atheists, it is not only necessary to consider the arguments they present, but also to know the Catholic faith tradition as a unified and coherent intellectual construct, as I mentioned before in reference to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Cardinal Dulles once remarked that courses in apologetics had practically vanished from the curriculum in Catholic seminaries and universities after the Second Vatican Council. And that has largely been my experience as well. So I was not only surprised but edified to find when I moved in next door to St. Patrick's Seminary and University in Menlo Park in the Archdiocese of San Francisco, that for the past four years, the previously elective course on apologetics has been required of all students of theology. Last year's Synod of Bishops asked, and I quote, theologians to develop a new apologetics of Christian thought, that is, a theology of credibility adequate for a new evangelization, end of quote. Along with the bishops of the, of the Synod, some 300 from all different parts of the world, I strongly encourage our Catholic colleges and universities to take up the challenge to provide their students with such courses in apologetics. Indeed, better, better yet, to let their students have a say about the landscape that the new apologetics should address. I wonder too, hoping not to wear out the kind welcome I have received here, whether the apologetics course should not be a part of the curriculum at American campus ministry centers. It's true that these courses might not be taught for university credit, but there is a life credit, even a heavenly credit, that puts them in a rank by themselves. Secondly, after the questions about the existence and knowledge of God referred to above, I want to call attention gratefully to the work of Jesuit Father Robert Spitzer, former president of Gonzaga University, who has founded the Magis Center in the Diocese of Orange in California in order to develop apologetics materials appropriate for college and high school age students. Spitzer recalls his own studies in physics as a spur to examining the questions posed by contemporary research in areas like cosmology and evolution. He is convinced that today's students need to be given tools to deal with the biases that presume an automatic hostility or incompatibility between faith and science that they will encounter in contemporary culture and even in higher education. A third area that needs to be part of a new apologetics is human sexuality. Today's hookup culture can all too often block the mature development of the erotic side of sexuality into the love called agape, a love that learns how to give and sacrifice in marriage and family, a love that prepares the human heart for the God who is love. Pope John Paul II addressed this question in a series of catechesis known as the theology of the body. And in his first encyclical, Deus Caritas Est, God is love, Pope Benedict XVI gave a remarkable presentation of how eros and agape are related in love, both human and divine. Fourth, I suggest that we need to examine the good, the ethical question that underlies all human activity and interaction. All cultures have codes by which good and bad behavior is identified, taught, punished, and promoted. We cultivate virtues that help us to seek and do the good in our lives, to contribute to peace, to love our neighbor even as ourselves. With the growing complexity of a globalized culture, 
we have learned as well to look beyond the individual good to the common good. It is this common good that over the past century and a half has been the object of a social teaching or doctrine in the church. This social doctrine constitutes an important dimension of our responsibilities as citizens of the world in which we live. A new apologetics should include an assessment of these responsibilities in the light of the challenging economic, political, and environmental issues of the time. It can help us respond to the challenge of today's culture that imagines us, Christians and Catholics, since we Christians are citizens of both the city of man and the city of God, as people who have here no lasting home, that we can say our prayers, long for heaven, and forget about the needs of the world around us. Catholic social teaching, perhaps our too well-kept secret, belies such a caricature. Moreover, it is not Catholics with our social, te social teaching about and call to responsibility for the common good who neglect the needs of our neighbor, of peace at home and abroad, of an environment for which God, the God of the Bible makes us responsible. If anything, it is neo-socialist policies that ignore the dignity of the human person and human freedom, and a Randian neo-capitalist quest for riches without any apparent social conscience that prevent the common good from becoming the peaceable goal of humanity. Having had occasion to speak a lot about the truth and a bit about the good, I must not neglect the beautiful, the third of the great transcendentals to which the study of philosophy has directed her students since classical times. I had the occasion recently to view the remarkable series Catholicism prepared by Father Robert Barron. I want to add it as a fifth dimension of the landscape of American culture. Barron's Catholicism is an apologetics that uses the treasury of art, music, architecture to accompany the telling of the Christian message with the beauty of artistic and architectural images and with the beauty of music in our ears. Some of the images have a power that cannot adequately be put into words. I thank Father Barron for bringing this new dimension to our attention, of underlining the importance of beauty in the service of a new apologetics for the new evangelization. As Pope Benedict is quoted as saying shortly before his election, and I quote here, the only really effective apolog apologia for Christianity comes down to two arguments, namely, the saints the church has produced and the art which has grown in her womb. Watching several episodes of Catholicism begin, I was newly moved by the scene of Michelangelo's fresco of the Last Judgment on the back wall of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. Each scene, each episode begins with a panorama of various images. Just a month or so ago, I spent two days looking at that image as a cardinal elector of our church's new pope during the Sede Vacante after the resignation of Pope Benedict XVI. The power of the images created by the great Renaissance artist Michelangelo, with a young, hefty Christ in the center, arm raised in judgment, surrounded by grim scenes of hell, of a purgatory, but not without hope, of heavenly choirs, and of Mary and the saints, whom we have come to know or know about, present a, med a meditation on what awaits both us personally and what is the destiny of all humanity. You will forgive me this personal digression, as I mentioned, without violation of the oath of secrecy concerning the conclave, which I took and will observe, how I felt time after time, holding aloft in my right hand the ballad on which I had written a single surname. I approached that majestic scene on the back wall of the Sistine Chapel to put my ballot on the plate covering the opening of the urn at the altar at the back wall under the fresco. Every time the cardinal elector, every cardinal elector places his ballot in the urn, he must speak aloud the following oath in Latin. Uh, here I give it in English. I call as my witness Christ the Lord, who will be my judge, that my vote is given to the one who before God I think should be elected. It certainly makes you think. And it made me think. <laughs> and it made me think as I prepared these remarks. How powerful are the beautiful images that have accompanied the unfolding of our 2,000 year history as church. Surely these should not be neglected in developing the new apologetics to explain and defend the faith and hope that is ours in this culture and time in which we live 
so much in need of a new evangelization. Finally, the sixth and last of these landscape refle reflections focuses on the individualist spirit that dominates American culture. This is already evident from some of what I have said. Whether it be the economic or the political sphere, it seems impossible to ignore the desire for individual independence at the expense of the social compact in our land. One worries about the health of American democracy from this perspective. And even though the health of democracy is not my theme this evening, it should not escape us that religion through the ages has always played an important role in society's progress. In this final lands landscape reflection, I want to address briefly the individualism that marks the religious landscape of America. This is a vast field populated by observations about therapeutic religion and by the, about the priority of the spiritual over the religious. It is this last dichotomy that seems to me the most significant for today's renewed apologetics. How many times does one hear, well, I am a spiritual person, but I don't have any religion as such, or words to this effect. Already in 1985, the sociologist of religion, Robert Bella, identified among the trends in the American religious landscape, the growth of an individualism, of an individualism that sought out a spiritual identity that allowed for a therapeutic approach to wholesome, healing self-affirmation while rejecting religious affiliation as hypocritical or non-productive. Bella gives the following description of Sheila Larson, a young nurse who received a good deal of therapy and who describes her faith as Sheilaism. She says, and quote uh, here, he quotes what she says, Bella quotes it, I believe in God. I'm not a religious fanatic. I can't remember the, remember the last time I went to church. My faith has carried me a long way. It's Sheilaism, just my own little voice. In defining my own Sheilaism, she said, it's just to try to love yourself and be gentle with yourself. You know, I guess, take care of each other. I think he would want us to take care of each other." End quote. Well, one can rightly be sympathetic of the needs of therapeutic nurturing. Uh, while one can be right and sympathetic, the problem for apologetics is the identification of God with the self. Narcissism has a long human history. So does seeking the God within. In the Judeo-Christian Bible, it is a classic instance of idolatry. I consider this an important landscape marker, especially uh, as I read Ross Duth Duthat, I'm going to pronounce it, Duthat's recent book, Bad Religion, which is a journalist review of the state of therapeutic religion today, from Oprah, Oprah Winfrey to Gilbert's Eat, Pray, Love, where we read that God dwells within you as you yourself, exactly the way you are. Duthat analogies, a, analyzes today's therapeutic religiosity. If anything, it dominates the American religious landscape even more than it did a quarter century ago. I consider this dichotomy between the spiritual and the religious, or perhaps more realistically, this escape from religion and its demands and rituals into a spiritual me to be perhaps the most significant challenge to the new apologetics of our time. My brief conclusion, apologetics and the year of faith. If we believe the good news that Christ frees us from sin and brings us through death to eternal life, this is something we should want to share with others. But before addressing that task, I want to point out that there is at least one person you must evangelize. I speak you, but we must evangelize. But I'm saying, I was saying you must evangelize. And he or she is sitting in your chair. College is a time when we reevaluate our understanding of a lot of things we formerly took for granted. It is no longer enough to accept our beliefs, determine our priorities, or guide our actions on the basis of what other people have told us. Such explorations are natural and healthy, although we might wonder sometimes where our foundations have gone. These explorations can be carried out while we still affirm our faith. As Cardinal Newman observed, a thousand difficulties do not constitute a doubt. However, we must not be naive. We live in an atmosphere that is increasingly secular and ah-religious when it is not anti-religious. 
we cannot help but be influenced by our culture, and this makes it all the more imperative that we work on deepening our spiritual life and come to a mature understanding of our Catholic faith. There are many reasons people stop practicing their faith, but I think one of the most common is that their religious education ended when they were 14. The answers appropriate for a child are not sufficient for many an adult. It may have been true in the past when the dominant culture was religious, that a person could neglect to study what we believe, but that is no longer true. If you profess faith in Christ and seek to live as a member of his body, the church, you are swimming against the current. Evangelization is ongoing, and that means our own personal examination of the reasons for our hope must be ongoing too. One of the blessings of apologetics, as Cardinal Dell has also noted, is that it allows us to confront the inner heretic in us all. He went on to make this important observation. I quote him, belief ordinarily rests not on proof, but on a relationship of trust. Where there is such a relationship between a husband and wife, they can count on one another to be faithful. Within the church, we have an analogous network of relationships. God speaks to us through Jesus Christ, who speaks to us through those who wrote the scriptures and through those who teach in his name in the church. Faith is an interpersonal relationship with those who speak in the name of God. If we open ourselves to their testimony, we are able to enter into the new world of faith, which would otherwise remain inaccessible to us. Far from restricting us, faith extends the range of our experience and knowledge. So tell us. To sum up, the real good news is Jesus Christ. He gives us the reasons for our hope. As we draw near to him, we apply our minds to the questions why we believe what we believe about him, to discover both for ourselves and for others why our faith in Christ is reasonable. And we do this as members of his body, the church, the community of witnesses guided by the Holy Spirit down through the ages. We meet for this inaugural Father Richard Russell lecture at a very propitious moment in the life of the church. Over the past couple of months, we have seen the retirement of Pope Benedict and the election of our new Holy Father, Pope Francis, the first from the New World to occupy the chair of Peter. The context in which these dramatic events have taken place is the year of faith. I would like to conclude with a ref reflection about the year of faith written by Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio while he was still Archbishop of Buenos Aires. I quote him, to begin this year of faith, is a call to us to deepen in our lives that faith we have already received. To profess our faith with our mouth implies living it in our hearts and showing it in what we do. It is a testimony and public commitment. The disciple of Christ, a child of the church, can never think that believing is a private matter. It is an important and strong challenge for every day. And he or she must be convinced that the one who began the good work in us will continue to perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. A citation from Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Thank you for your attention this evening. God bless you. I'm sure that lecture will generate an awful lot of questions. Uh, please pass your questions on the cards to the aisle, and uh, Yaja will serve as moderator for as much time as we have. Uh, while you're doing that, just uh, to go back to one of your earlier points, Your Eminence, uh, many students would say they know about Christ, but they, they don't know Christ personally, have a personal relationship with Christ. What advice would you give to a student who said he, wanted to, he or she wanted to have a personal relationship with Christ? What components would you say would they need to go about that? I think that uh, in our Catholic tradition, at least in my experience, um, uh, we have to take a, take a step back from the busy everyday uh, run of the, of the world we're in. We have to go on retreat, or we have to uh, take uh, some time with a spiritual director, or maybe with a confessor. We have to, we have to step back and look at 
uh, at the uh, relationship we have with Christ and the ways in which we can be helped in our prayer and reading to deepen that relationship. I think that that's an important thing that uh, a busy, a very busy world with all its demands doesn't encourage us to do, but I really think it's one of the avenues to, uh, to respond to that question that you raised. Thank you, Your Eminence, for your talk tonight. I'd like to ask a few uh, questions from the community and from our students, if that would be all right. The first one is about your experience with the catechism and catechesis. Uh, as an editor of the catechism, um, you've been talking about evangelization, but I would appreciate it if you would say a little bit more about catechesis. How do we get the young and the young in the faith to the point where they can evangelize either in the old or the new way? Thank you. Well, um, um, I guess the burden of my thoughts would be that, uh, you know, I, I'm not a, an educator by trade, that is, I, I haven't studied theories of education, but I think typically we all would say that um, very young people um, absorb what they are taught to make sure that they get the right uh, information as young people. And uh, then um, corresponding to our development uh, as adolescents and as young adults, we we have to be more and more challenged to begin to think for ourselves and to, uh, to look at the uh, questions of faith from uh, a perspective where we can be assisted in understanding background, uh, historical development, uh, why the uh, shape of our faith took uh, the expression it did and not some other expression. So um, the catechesis, I think catechesis is, uh, is ongoing catechesis is a companion to life living the faith. And it should not end, uh, as I say, when we're 14 or 21, or uh, in a certain way it goes on all through our life, or at least it should go on. We, we, have, we, you know, we all have hobbies and we read this and that, but I think sometimes we don't, um, we don't sufficiently read in areas of, uh, of uh, faith, uh, uh, spiritual, spirituality, um, that comes from our tradition and in those ways uh, have an opportunity to mature further in the faith that we profess and uh, really take joy in it because uh, there's a lot to be, a lot to rejoice about. Thank you. The next question is, how does one communicate and live the meekness of Christ while boldly and constantly proclaiming the truth of our faith? I, from the questioner, find it hard to be meek and express humility while being assured that I have the truth in the faith of Christ Jesus? No, it's a very thoughtful question, uh, and it's true. Um, I think uh, my thought here was, um, uh, I mean, I, I accept uh, what I quoted there uh, from uh, Cardinal George, that, um, uh, that uh, it's a... Um, it's desirable for our new apologetics. I think it helps to respond to the uh, accusations of the old apologetics that it was um, too in your face, too much um, antagonistic. Um, uh, meekness there, I think, uh, and humility are characteristic of, uh, should be really a characteristic of a, of a Christian disciple. That doesn't mean that, uh, I don't mean it's not a, a groveling uh, humility that says, oh, of course you're right, you must be right, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a worm and, and uh, I never had a reasonable thought in my life. No, nothing like that, but, but it's just, to, it, it's to say that, uh, uh, that you, don't, uh, you don't make uh, real progress to a meeting of minds and, uh, and a quest for the truth by, uh, by, um, uh, 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 responding in a way that uh, that uh, uh, makes people hate you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next question is about the topic of suffering. How should the new evangelization uh, approach the topic of suffering? Well, uh, I guess if I had thought about that, I might have put it in my talk, but I mean, thank you for the question. It's uh, worth thinking about. Um, it's a, it's a, uh, yeah, I, I believe uh, the questioner has in mind, uh, I imagine, that that's uh, probably one of the key challenges of, um, 
uh, and perennial challenges of um, looking at uh, the meaning of life and the reason we're here and the suffering uh, suffering it needs to be thought through. I'll, uh, I'll give that more thought and um, get back to you on it, but I, I th appreciate the question and it, um, it will certainly make me think. Thank you. The next question is about different kinds of apologetics. Should there be a different approach towards academic apologetics and pastoral apologetics? If so, what should the differences be? I think uh, the academic apologetics. I, I do think that there is uh, there is sufficient material for, let us say, um, a uh, a good academic course in apologetics, both from the history of apologetics, uh, two thousand years, uh, examples, uh, different styles of uh, you know. I mentioned the autobiographical style, the the uh, uh, the question of um, um, Picking a uh, th um, hypothetical dialogue partner, mm -hmm. kind of a Socratic methodology, and uh, uh, exposing all the issues and so forth. So, uh, from that point of view, I think uh, uh, an academic apologetics is possible and and useful and should be pursued. Uh, practical apologetics uh, will have to be m more culturally sensitive, I think. Um, uh, the, the apologetics uh, that would be useful in America will not be the same apologetics if, that might be useful in Nigeria or uh, maybe even Brazil. I mean, I think there's a certain commonality in first world countries, but um, I remember a meeting with bishops and theologians in India about three years ago, and um, um, I was not uh, uh, prepared for the uh, the dominant Hindu culture and how much uh, of a challenge it presents to the small Christian community in, in, uh, in India. And, um, and uh, sometimes um, it, it, uh, I think it even made them um, a little uh, nervous about being um, openly Christian. And there was some reason for that nervousness because they were, some of them were under attack by uh, having their churches burned and so forth. But, so it, uh, all I'm saying is that those things will differ according to the various cultures, but um, in terms of practical apologetics, uh, that, that there have to be a great deal of adaptation to the, uh, to the local situation. Thank you. Just a few more questions. Um, the next one is about dialogue. <coughs> Given the importance of dialogue to the church, both in your talk and from the Second Vatican Council, why does the church appear to be stifling such dialogue of late? And do you believe this will change under our current Holy Father practice? Stifling dialogue of late? Well, I don't think uh, some would accuse the church just of having arrived at stifling dialogue just of late. I mean, that <laughs> their, their <laughs> accusations go back a long ways on that score. So. Um, I think, uh, well, um, it, it, it's, uh, I, I feel this <laughs> somewhat sensitively, I suppose, as Prefect Emeritus of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, but uh, um, where we have a responsibility for promoting the faith on the one hand and defending the faith on the other. I know when, when the, the former Archbishop's secretary said, you know, but one of our troubles is that even when we're promoting the faith, we're sounding like we're defending it, and uh, so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, invite a dialogical uh, stance. Um, well, I think, again, tone is important, um, but uh, I found, and I just uh, can't say that every time somebody uh, puts you into the, uh, the category of your pre-written uh, article for the New York Times that you know, you have to then write a letter to the editor. I mean, that, that's just a part of what we're dealing with in the present age. I mean, you, you can say uh, stifling, uh, uh, I mean, uh, if you come out with a review of somebody's book that is, uh, that shows that what, uh, where it, uh, it goes contrary to Catholic teaching, you're, you can be accused of stifling dialogue, but in fact, uh, you're honoring the search for truth. From, from another perspective. So I think, uh, uh, I think we need to uh, um, look at it from, uh, 
from the point of view of um, uh, not of uh, uh, let's say of a, of a more um, scientific evaluation, not just uh, a headline uh, about uh, church comes out again and this and that and the other thing. It seems to me that uh, that uh, church has a good good reason uh, and ability to defend its um, its uh, doctrines and. You know, if that's called stifling dialogue, well, make, make sure it isn't that, but uh, if it's called it, move on to the next uh, question. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is about pluralism. In the context of the new evangelization, how do you understand the value of pluralism, i.e. the independent contribution of atheism and non-Christian religions to the kingdom of God and human flourishing? Uh, well, uh, those are two different questions. Um, certainly, uh, uh, from in my view, uh, um, the contribution of atheism um, to um, the kingdom of God, um, I would have to be shown uh, something about uh, what kind of contribution that might be. It doesn't occur to me immediately. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think we do have a lot to learn from other, other religious traditions, uh, even non-Christian religious traditions, in which, uh, uh, which many of them demonstrate a very, a very um, uh, deep uh, search for uh, the transcendent and for the divine that uh, uh, can be useful for us in our own uh, awareness of, uh, of uh, how God's plan for humanity and the religious uh, dimension of humanity can be satisfied in various ways. Not satisfied, but I mean how it can lead. The early fathers of the church called many, called the, uh, some of the pagan religions um, sparks of the, there were sparks of the divinity and, um, uh, and uh, they, uh, so I think that that's a, th those are two separ separate and separable uh, uh, issues uh, for discussion. And I forget exactly now, I'm, I'm, I've distracted myself from the, maybe from the point of your question, I'm not sure, but. I think that's it about pluralism, atheism. Ah, pluralism. Pluralism, yeah, well, okay, pluralism, you know, is a kind of a generic uh, catch, uh, ga catch them, gather them, uh, gather all, but um, I don't think there is a, a, pl a pluralism as such. It's uh, it's to say that uh, you know that uh, we are there are different cultures and different approaches and so forth. But um, there isn't a pluralism that um, we are in dialogue with. It's um, it's just a, it's a description of the fact that uh, this is a many faceted and many sided uh, humanity that we live in, and uh, so we need to take into account all of the facets and aspects of it. Thank you. A question from one of our Divinity School students. You mentioned at the beginning of your talk that the term new evangelization was used by John Paul II and that the 1974 synod helped to motivate the new, evangel new evangelization's arrival. What were the reasons why the older or the old evangelization failed? Did actions taken by the institutional church contribute to its failure? If so, which actions were those? Well, uh, the answer is. Uh, is no, so I mean I can uh, then I don't have to identify any actors. No, <laughs> let me say um, uh, the uh, I don't think the old evangelization has failed. I think uh, you know it is um, it, it has uh, had uh, two thousand years of uh, of a variety of approaches to bringing forward the the uh, the uh, Gospel of Jesus Christ and its uh, validity and beauty uh, for for his culture. So, I I guess um, the new evangelization I think uh, um, would um, try to um, do for evangelization what the gener generic question about um, uh, about modernity, the church and modernity, how. Uh, are there new aspects for evangelization that we can and must take into account in order to be faithful and useful uh, preachers and, and um, uh, exponents of the gospel of Christ? 
And uh, so I would say that's uh, the invitation, I think, that we're, we're given in looking at a new evangelization and the subplot that I've right, tried to deal with here this evening, the new apologetics in the service of that evangelization and in the service of faith in general. Thank you. Another question about um, non-Catholic Christian churches. What role do other Christian churches play in the new evangelism as you see it? Specifically, how can Christian churches effectively cooperate in proclaiming this gospel, especially when the hierarchies are not working together? Well, um, that would be would have been a, a more neutral question had it not been for that last rejoinder. But nevertheless, uh, um, a, I think, uh, insofar as we have so much in common as Christians, um, you know, it has been a kind of a scandal for uh, for evangelization uh, that um, Christians. Um, uh, spend more time challenging each other than they do preaching the good news to uh, to a non-Christian world. But um, uh, the um, question about hierarchies, um, I won't go. You know, some, I, I was five years uh, co-chair with a very fine uh, Episcopal bishop for the Anglican Roman Catholic U.S. dialogue and. Uh, uh, we got along pretty well together, so I, I don't, uh, I just, um, I guess I don't, don't accept the premise. The, um, I mean, I, I think uh, Christians can work together, but uh, the, uh, uh, whether we do or not, uh, I think depends on uh, and you, you look at the fundamentalist Christians, you look at evangelical Christians, you look at mainline Protestant Christians, I mean, you look at the Catholics, I mean, you know, that's a, who is the, uh, was it Joyce that said, uh, here comes everybody, you know, you know, the Catholic Church, I mean, it's a, it, it's a good question, but um, uh, uh, let's hope that we can find ways of, um, working together in the new evangelization more efficiently than we have or more successfully than we have. Thank you. Just two more questions, I think. Um, you think. Just like what it says, <laughs> too often it seems like the Catholic Church preaches a highly separate, self-referential gospel of being Catholic, as if the good news is a kind of denominational identity. Do you feel the Catholic Church on the ground lacks an outward proclamation? If so, how can Catholics break free of the self-focus on identity to tell people about some radically other good news? I'm not sure I understand the question, but I don't necessarily, uh, I really don't, um, I mean, um, somebody is, I suppose, referring to some personal experience that I, I, can't, I don't inna you know, innately share, so I, I don't want to comment on that aspect. Uh, um, Self-referential. Well, it's uh, it's an open book. Catholic faith is an open book. You, you know, I don't know if it's self-referential. It's it's the gospel that Jesus preached, that the apostles uh, received and transmitted. Uh, there it is. So, uh, yes, it's self-referential, and in the sense of uh, referring to. Jesus, but uh, if it's self-referential and saying, well, the church is, uh, you know, we want you to be contributing members of the church, well, that's, you know, that, that would not be a good idea. That's hardly the gospel of Jesus, so. But uh, neither, neither would I separate Jesus from the community of disciples he founded, and that community is the church, so. I have one last question. Okay. Um, question is, a community rooted in Christ seems central to what it means to be church. How do we build to reveal truth and the privacy of fully formed consciences, informing and welcoming faith in a community that challenges and supports individuals as they grow in relationship with Christ personally and in community? Um, I think I, if, if I'm uh, on, the t on target with the a response to the questioner, um, 
I think uh, we could do more. Um, you probably, you may do it here more than others, uh, other places. In the church. I think that I think uh, Catholics need to, uh, as they deepen their knowledge and grow in their faith, have more opportunity to discuss it with their fellow Catholics and to. Um, and to understand it um, in relationship to that community of disciples that is the church. So that would be one response, that uh, there I think we've been uh, perhaps uh, not as um, creative as we might, uh, we, could have, we could be and still can be because after all, this is a church in progress and we're a faith in progress, so. Um, <coughs> So that maybe would be one thing I could say. Thank you. Thank you. Wait. Well, I thank you for your very, your very thoughtful comments and your lecture tonight. And I thank he who is the reason for our gathering together. I invite you all to the dining room for refreshments after this lecture and a chance to meet Cardinal Levada in the dining room. See you over there. Thank you. Thank you.